Okay, hey everyone, my name is Lukáš Rikaučan and I'm a researcher, I'm a theorist. I work mainly in the fields of political ecology and philosophy of technology, but also visual cultures. And it also leads me to this field of art, which is also what I'm going to talk about today, especially in relation to some of those artists that are really important for me personally, as, you know, a certain guidance in relation to my own field of or fields of research, if you will. Uh, I call this talk or I mean this piece of writing that I'm going to present to you today. The title is Cosmo Engineers, which means that it has something to do with cosmology, but also something to do with technology and engineering, but also art, as I'm going to explain in a due course. One of the points of departures for me is this book by uh, an Italian theorist whose name is Federico Campagna. The book is called Technic and Magic, and it's a kind of breathtaking journey to the depths of the ideological assumptions that actually shape this battlefield of reality today. And as he, as Campagna finds himself in this battlefield, he suddenly hears some rumor. It's a rumor about the passage hidden within the battlefield that leads to a forest beyond it. And as it turns out, as it turns out, this is the kind of hidden passage that is actually a wormhole, a kind of wormhole that takes you beyond the fabric of the world. And it lets you unveil this hidden scaffolding of the world, if you will. And that's the moment where, according, according to Campania, lies the realm of metaphysics. You know, that realm where we can account not just for basic ontological questions, that means questions like what does exist or what is existence, but also for, I mean, this, I mean, explosion of things, explosion of possible things, things that are possible and impossible within our world. That's also what is the part of the realm of metaphysics. And so as we see this map of the reality dominated by instrumental rationality today, Campania labels this kind of map, this instrument rational map of the world by the, by the term technic. And he attempts to reconstruct the reality in other way by re-enchanting the reality under the banner of this, the perspective of the world that Campania calls magic, or the same as quote unquote technic, we have here quote unquote magic. And so here's the regime of the technic, which is the reality rendered as completely foldable into the system of linguistic classification. And on the other hand, we have the realm or the regime of magic which brings back the moment of that which exceeds verbalization. And that's what Campania calls the ineffable, ineffable. That is what is excessive, what is, in other words, and that's a very important word for me, what is poetic. And that's a kind of picture where we see rivaling orderings of reality. And here we also see a kind of a potential to see something like a cosmological dimension, one where social and cultural and also political worldviews are under con constant process of formation. And what is my aim now is not to repeat Campania's dichotomy, because it's very Heideggerian, and there are good reasons to avoid it. Uh, I don't want to place a kind of or to pose a kind of dichotomy of two worldviews, uh, which is actually, I mean, these worldviews of the technic and the magic, they are actually, you know, rehearsal of this ancient Greek duality of techne and poiesis, or poetics, technics and poetics. And instead of you know, rehearsing this duality, what I would like to do instead is to follow Campania's intuition about the decisive role of cosmologies in our social, cultural, and also political life. But I want to follow this intuition somewhere else. 
What I'm going to do is to trace artistic attempts to bridge the supposed gap between the poetic as the instance of the magical and the technical as the instance of instrumental rationality. And I want to find these bridges in gestures of something that I call poetic engineering. That's a genre of practice, which is resolutely pragmatic, resolutely analytic. It is also anti-aesthetic, and it is, of course, also sensitive towards the mundane and towards the immediate. This kind of practice is a speculative practice of world making, where also the art is understood as something that I would call cultural technique, as something which is a cosmologically productive tool. And for that reason, I would like to nickname the poetic engineering by another label. It can be differently called a kind of cosmological engineering. And now you may ask the question, so where do I find any instances of cosmological engineering? Well, uh, I'm a Slovak thinker, and I have recently realized that the genealogies of the Slovak art and thinking are very rich repositories of cosmological endeavors. And this, I mean, uh, this, this piece of thought that I want to present you today is also a reflection on the process of discovering the prehistory and history of culture and intellectual production that became so urgently needed in the wake of the ecological emergency and which is also central to my own philosophy. Because I frequently deal with concepts like cosmology, planetology, world as a wall, and so on. And you know, my desire is really to embrace the tradition of the Slovak cosmological engineering in order to better understand some tacit or implicit dimensions also of my own thought that always lives you know, its own life and also to trace certain traditions that create a tacit dimension of the current intellectual and historical moment, where my peers and my colleagues strive to articulate the map of reality that would evacuate, evacuate us from the bottom ground of the infinite capitalist present, which is articulated in the deadlock of ecological emergency. Uh, so, uh, let me start with noting that there is this analytic aspect of the cosmological engineering and it is best exemplified by one very prominent visual artifact and that is diagram. Uh, if you look at years 1967 to 1970, what we see here is the work of Slovak conceptual artists probably the most important one, or I mean, at least the most famous one, and that's Stano Filko. And Filko prepared this uh, album, which was titled Associations, which is actually a collection of diagrams, of images, and also of colleges that explain his vision of the cosmological structure of universe, of what we can label following also the curators of Filko's posthumous grand exhibition at Slovak National Gallery, Lucia Gregorova Stach and Aurel Hrabusicki, what we can label following them as hidden scaffolding of the world. The hidden scaffolding of the world that Filko traced in his artistic practice. There is one particular image from this association series that depicts a circle. This circle represents the universe that is divided into five elements or five segments. And that's earth, fire, air, water, and the sphere of the human. Uh, and there's uh, also another strand of diagrams that is kind of more like placemaking in the sense that it places the map of the solar system to the center of the square in the generic Slovak neighborhood. But both of these diagrams, I mean, the, the diagram of the solar system and also the diagram of, you know, the structure, the kind of ontological fivefold structure of the universe, 
Both of these diagrams in a different manner represent a type of diagram with an explicit cosmological ambition, which we can label by historian John Tresh as a kind of cosmogram. Uh, cosmograms in Tresh, in the research of John Tresh, uh, if you look into one of his essays, which is also titled Cosmograms, he uses here an architectural example of an Old Testament temple known as Tabernacle, which was designed as an easily transportable house of Jehovah. And wherever it was deployed, its role was not just that of a place of worship, but it was simultaneously also a large model of the universe because its structure and its measures represented basic cosmological relations, such as, for example, relations uh, between the God and his chosen people, relations between the people and the rest of creation, or simply, and also more generally, uh, different relations between ontological domains, ontological domains attributing different properties and agencies to different parts of created universe. So cosmograms can be defined as diagrams of intrinsic logics of our universe, if we follow Tresh here. These cosmograms, they do a work of diagramming, a labor of diagramming of the logic of relations, for instance, between the domain of the human and the non-human, or the divine and the profane. And uh, if I follow here some observations made, for example, by Jan Ferbert, Philco's error is in its sense a giant cosmogram, or rather a kind of abnormally large collection of cosmograms. Um, and there's, you know, there's this general system of his practice, which is, of course, divided into these five zones according to colors, red, green, blue, white, and black. And if we also follow through these aforementioned diagrammatic drawings and collages to his general interest in astronomy, space, and in realizations of microcosmic projects in the form of speculative social happenings, such as Hapsok series with Alex Mlinarczyk, we I think we can gather here enough evidence to call Filko a cosmological engineer in his own right. Also for Ferbert, the true medium of Filko's practice was always the world itself in the form of intuitively graspable yet always ephemeral totality that can be approached through a multitude, a multitude of possible cosmological structures and orderings. Uh, so we, Ashim Bamp, uh, a very important contemporary Cameroonian thinker, he would call it that Phil cooperated in the realm of simultaneous multiplicities. And as a heuristic gesture, for, for Filco, the diagram becomes here the tool to situate the perceiving subject in front of a map of the world as a wall that synthesizes the scientific drive for objective description of the totality of the cosmos with a kind of phenomenological imperative of the world as a wall, quote unquote, the world as a wall, which is a fundamental arc of human being in the world of human being in the world. This is a kind of Heideggerian, a Heideggerian, very Heideggerian thing to say, but I rec recall here someone else like Jan Patochka and his claim that the problem of philosophy is the world as a whole. Of course, he's also a phenomenologist, but uh, it's important to understand this as something that can be you know, also evacuated from the phenomenological tradition and used in different settings as well of different philosophical settings. Because just think about Philco's practice also through what Thomas Nagel demands from philosophy at the beginning of his book, The View from Nowhere, from 1986. Uh, his demand is not exactly phenomenological. He demands something more, Nagel. And I think that Philco realizes this ambition in the artistic realm. Nagel demands from philosophy to combine the perspective of a particular person inside the world with an objective view of that same world, the person and his viewpoint included. And this case, the case of Philco, it also shows us that 
cosmograms function as abstract machine. That's not the, the, I mean, that's not Heideggerian, but the Lusian term, abstract machine. And cosmograms functioning like abstract machines can govern the transition between different cosmologies, not just depicting one cosmology, but also be a sort of differential or a switch between different cosmologies. And cosmograms can also, in the sense of being abstract machines, can somewhere place you as a sort of interface. They can place you on a specific cosmological background. So you can be a traveler between these cosmological backgrounds by means of cosmograms. And from this fact of their abstract nature, this abstract nature of diagrams, it also follows that diagrams do not need to be necessarily pictorial or somehow explicitly discursive for the sake of the argument. Because in reality, they can be instead manifested in a very anti-aesthetic manner. Their ambition is not to provide a specific perceptual experience, but to produce some situation or some context. And this specific aspect is further pronounced in how cosmograms work cosmologically, that they directly situate you in a given cosmos, to use the Greek word cosmos, that they provide a gateway to. And furthermore, uh, the profile of cosmograms can be in this sense also absolutely minimal because they can be just a simple gesture, a detail, a gentle intervention, a gentle intervention that problematizes the cosmological rendering of a site or of a concept under standard conditions. And in some of its instances, this cosmological engineering then can be alternatively understood also as a very proletarian mode of artistic production. So it is not just analytic, what, showed, what was shown in the case of Filco. It is not only anti-aesthetic, but it is also proletarian mode of artistic production or a kind of production which is motivated by a proletarian way of life. And it is also directed in this sense towards the reinforcement of the dignity of the proletarian way of life. And here I follow Slovak cur curator uh, Daniel Gruny to suggest that in these cases, uh, it is Julius Scholar and his work that, especially his work with cultural situation, that exhibit this kind or, or exemplify this kind of proletarian cosmology and also of proletarian diagrammatics of proletarian cosmograms. Because, you know, uh, Kolor himself explicitly declared that his artistic project is deliberately anti-aesthetic. Uh, and, you know, also the curators of his posthumous show at uh, Viennese Mumok, which is the affirmation Daniel Gruen, but also Catherine Romberg and Georg Scholhammer, uh, they recollect some of his statements, uh, like, I want to put an end to aesthetics, I want to create proletarian modesty, and I want to engage instead of arrange. These are some of the slogans of Kohler's work. And especially in the last of these claims, it further elaborates on our provisional theory of cosmological productivity of, of certain artistic practices. Because cosmologies are never dealt with aesthetic conceptual structures. They are engaged with, they are lived and performed. Or in other words, we are always engaged in some cosmology, and that means also in some kind of cosmogrammatological struggle. So, um, think about Kohler's cultural situation then as something that fits the theory of cosmological productivity, because, you know, his gestures in the series of photos which was, which was taken by Kvyatoslava Fulierova and which was titled Subjective Objective Cultural Situations, or, I mean, in brackets, UFO, as many of his works were uh, subtitled. Uh, this, this series of photos serves as demarcation of singularity that his body stands for. Because in each of these photos, 
color puts himself into a position of a cosmological agent that can create new worlds by the most mundane gestures. And also to circle back, to circle back to the introductory polemics with Campania's dualism of technique and magic, what would be a better confession of a belief in the magical, in the belief of the poetic dimension of reality than a claim that you can indeed give a life to a new cosmos by a symbolic action. What would be a better confession of such a belief? Because, you know, it seems that Kohler's work distills the very core of poetic engineering in his fascination with both excessively complex, complex symbolic systems, which is also the trait that Kohler shares with Filco, and also in this, you know, this uh, fascination with technological condition of late modernity. Because for Filco, the cosmic, and also for color, the cosmic is not only a latent dimension that somehow works in the background of his works of Filco, but in this case also of color, because it is also a reality of humankind technically equipped to travel outside of its home planet, which becomes a cosmic dimension for color here. And he has this term that also Daniel Grun uh, invokes, and that's the term cosmohumanism, which also echoes the scientific technical revolution of 1960s, which was mainly impersonated by the research team of Radovan Richta and his famous book, Civilization at the Crossroads. And it also exists in a close proximity to philosophy of lesser known Slovak philosopher, Rudolf Schima, who also belonged to the same generation as Richta, Koller, and Filko. In this work of the thinker Rudolf Schima, what we see is a kind of dichotomy between geocentric and cosmocentric perspective. And that situates humanity as a species of astronauts that wander through the universe in their spaceship Earth. And this is the cosmocentrism. This, that's also cosmocentrism that represents for Shima a profound change of humanity's conception of its own purpose, one that combines newly acquired humility with a sense of undiscovered potential. And so while Shima's cosmocentrism adopts in the sense, you know, this kind of Promethean view on human species, Kuller is fortunately happy with his proletarian modesty. A proletarian modesty that for good reason seems to shy away from the excesses of too much techno-optimism, but also of too much universalism. And, uh, you know, as we know now on the brink of the third decade of the 21st century, these terms like universalism, humanity or humanism has been discredited discredited as implicitly racist, racist, implicitly colonial, and also implicitly sexist categories. But I still hope that we can read Kohler's call for cosmohumanism in another sense too, as a reminder that each cosmological perspective, that each cosmological perspective contains as its crucial element a specific conception of subjectivity and also a specific conception of agency. The subjectivity and agency that can be modulated by technological alteration, that's engineering of the setting in which the given subject or agent occurs. So this technological alteration here doesn't mean or doesn't suggest some deployment of huge machinery or computational infrastructure. It doesn't necessarily have to be so, because I believe that both Filco and Kohler actually worked with their art in this cosmological dimension as something that actually is a technology of subjectivity, that in their practice, the art becomes a technology of subjectivity, as something that leads to engineering of a new map or a plan of reality. And not only of the new map of reality, but also the new map or plan of human subject. And that includes also 
the subject's agency. That's a kind of perspective that, at least to me, echoes contemporary theories of Gayatri Chakravorty Spivak or Sylvia Winter, who linked the subjective dimension of the human with the larger cosmological renderings of our planet or of our history, all that in order to evacuate the category of the human from the deadlock of its racist past. So how does this transformation of subjectivity, how does this leap into the terrain of newly redistributed agency actually happens? Hmm? That's a good question. And I mean, I can return here to the notion of cosmogram uh, in order to follow the logic of diagrammatics here. Because diagrams, according to one of my favorite philosophers, French philosopher Gilles Châtelet, diagrams are not just images. They are something like trajectories or gestures of thinking. Châtelet says that a diagram can transfix a gesture. It can bring it to rest long before it curls up into a sign, which is exactly why modern geometers and cosmologers like diagrams with their, pre, you know, this peremptory power of evocation. Diagrams capture gestures mid-flight. And for those that are capable of attention, they are the moments where being is glimpsed smiling. And in that sense, diagrams are in a degree the accomplices of poetic metaphor. So these gestures that Shatla talks about, these do not simply point us somewhere, but as already said, they place us somewhere into a specific cosmological rendering of a situation. And so uh, an interest in geometry of thinking represented by diagrams is prominent also in the contemporary work of my colleague Zbigniew Baladran, because just as in case of Hungarian conceptual artist Anes Dennis, where we see, for example, maps of the earth and their un, you know, different unorthodox projections, uh, projections that function as engines of a specific activity of abstract placemaking. So just as in this case of the Ness, Baladran uses the map also as a diagram of placemaking in a very, very cosmic sense. He draws imaginative maps of the exomoons orbiting exoplanets in other solar systems. And, and in, in this gesture, you know, in this gesture, he makes distant and abstract objects something that suddenly becomes immediate and very tangible. And if at this point, the chain of thought leads from cosmology through cosmograms to diagrams and finally to places, I mean, whether distant and abstract places or close and concrete uh, places. So if this chain of thought is still somehow mysterious to you, it might be helpful to imagine cosmologies as a kind of mathematical philosophical objects. Call them cosmologies, call these cosmologies as, you know, topologies from the Greek word topoi, which translates exactly as place. And I do believe that it is these places that are elementary products of any cosmology. Places understood as rich phenomenological structures endowed with meaning. I can quote ethnographer Lisa Messeri here. She says that place suggests intimacy, intimacy that can scale down the cosmos, that can scale down the cosmos to the level of human experience. And it is exactly Masseri's ethnographic work with astronomers and planetary scientists that leads me to my concluding argument. 
Masseri traces different place-making activities of planetary scientists, you know, activities which turn abstract glimpses of light in their telescopes into real, tangible places. One can also, I mean, places one can also emotionally attach to. And this activity of turning abstract space into concrete place happens through imagining places on our own planet as otherworldly, such as, for example, in the case of Martian geology studying Mars through geological sites in the deserts of our planet, or it can also happen by means of different computer or even artistic visualizations and mappings. And here Messeri claims that the perspective when each star, when each star can have a planet that harbors life, that is a place that can be tangibly experienced through our own faculties of imagination and technological visualization. So this perspective profoundly changes how we see also our own planet, the planet Earth, uh, because this perspective positions Earth not as a singular blue marble that floats in a sea of darkness, as in this old 1972 blue marble picture taken by the astronauts of the last Apollo mission, Apollo 17. So instead of this blue marble, what we hear here, what we have here is the Earth as a one planet among many other planets on which humans might be capable to live. And what emerges here is the concept of the planetary place, which is a category that emerges from this placemaking activity. And this category at once transcends duality of the global and the local, and it also develops a new register of approaches and attachments, emotional but also intellectual attachments, to our planet. The planet Earth is then no longer an abstract globe, but a concrete home. And here, here I finally see the political ecological, or should I say poetic or poetical ecological? I mean, who knows? I would love to say that. <laughs> so I finally see this uh, the, the, here, this poetical ecological, but also political ecological relevance of the artistic endeavors of Filco, of Koller, of Denes, and also of Baladran. Because they train us in seeing art as a tool, a tool that is cosmologically productive and that can map and diagram new renderings of reality and of the place of human subject in this reality, our planet included. And in doing so, all these artistic practices unwittingly become instances where these artists that, you know, facilitate these practices become engineers, engineers of the world. And in that sense, that's exactly the moment where they transcend the duality of technique and magic the duality of techna and poiesis, because they diagram reality with a precision of an engineer and also with a sensitivity of a poet. So if a diagram is indeed an accomplice of poetic metaphor, to recall Gilles Chatelet's statement from a while ago, if that's the case, then cosmogrammatic results of artistic practices are engines of tangibility, engines of creatively transcending, of creatively transcending the subjective point of view towards its, you know, previously untaught constellations. Because you know, as Shuttler reminds us, metaphor does not sanction a pre-existing resemblance, but acts by creating what? by creating similarity. And that is extremely important today. <laughs>